And now, Deborah Colbelt Live. Thanks very much for that introduction, Kurt. And joining us today on Deborah Colbelt Live, I'm very honored to have uh, Thomas Teague um, of Direct Relief joining us, uh, President and CEO of Direct Relief. Thanks so much for being here, Thomas. Thank you for having me, Deborah. Yeah, I mean, Direct Relief is huge. Uh, they offer humanitarian aid basically where needed most. And gosh knows, it's certainly been needed most lately. And um, I'm actually going to have you take it away for us, Thomas, and tell us a little bit about uh, direct relief. And, um, you know, when you even started, when did direct relief start? I think it started way back, right, in uh, the 1948? 48, right. So yeah. it was, now direct relief was uh, started by two war immigrant uh, refugees who fled the Nazis. And they ended up in California with some significant wealth at the time. So what what's now direct relief was initially just the private foundation of really private efforts of these two immigrant business guys who ended up in Santa Barbara of all places. And as business refugee immigrants, they wanted to help people in bombed out Europe that had worked for them that they knew. So it was really not particularly well organized. Um, it got formally organized as a foundation in 1948. But what was interesting in retrospect uh, is that as business people, this was before the concept of corporate social responsibility even existed, right? But their na natural inclination was go to people like them who were in business and, and basically say, all those people in Europe need what you make and they can't afford it. So we're putting our own money in. And if you're so inclined, you're not gonna lose a sale to help them because they're not able to buy it now. And so that kind of developed an approach of trying to involve people who have something to do that's needed by folks who are not really viable consumers. And they picked health as an organizing principle. So fast forward the tape till now, I think we still do that. We try to encourage companies that make things often that are out of the reach of a low income person and make the same case, like you're in a good position to help uh, people who are never going to show up on your sales forecasts. And there's a lot more of them who show up in emergencies. So trying to encourage the participation of private people and companies who do things well. And we do that on an ongoing basis to address these chronic gaps for health services in the United States and around the world. And those chronic gaps get much bigger when an emergency happens. So we're set up as a pharmacy wholesaler. We have licenses in all 50 states to provide prescription drugs free of charge, um, which we do. And we also respond to emergencies because it's really that the need just spikes immediately. So we do and in, uh, inventory and stockpile things like PPE in case there's an infectious disease outbreak, which turned out to be you know, much needed over the last several months as COVID has appeared on our screen and kind of changed the whole world in many respects. Let's talk a little bit about PPE and let's talk about the need for masks in particular. We were talking earlier that um, you had a surplus of masks basically because of the wildfires, right, that happened right. here in California. And now with COVID-19, that's one of the main um, mm -hmm. shortfalls that a lot of our first responders didn't have masks. So talk to me about... Um, how you stepped in and provided masks and where did you provide them? Yeah, well, yeah, you're exactly right. We have been responding, the state almost burns down not every, every, each of the last four years have had the largest wildfire in history. And we've had this wonderful relationship over the years with 3M that makes all sorts of the, the Cadillac of masks. But, you know, it became a little unseemly that every year we would ask them for their entire inventory when they were trying to sell it. So. We actually went through the process of, I don't know if you can see this, but we were making our own. We thought, you know, ah. so we had these manufacturers, these direct relief N95 masks that are kind of bright orange. Mm -hmm. And we went through the whole process of getting them registered, the NIOSH, um, just for wildfires so that we could, you know, respond in California or even in Australia, if there was a big fire to filter out the particulate matter. Um, and we, buy buy those we have them manufactured in china they're registered in the u.s and we had a couple of million when the fire when covid happened so we were able to respond um to provide them when they became in such high demand and we also had other stocks of the surgical 
different types of the surgical masks, the ear loop masks, um, as well as uh, millions of gloves and not as many gowns, but kind of the basics that you would need for kind of infection control. And just the demand spiked so rapidly while the supply contracted uh, at the same time. So it caused this crazy shortage. And we were fortunate that we had stocks available. We still had channels of incoming material that had been previously ordered. And we had good relations with companies like 3M that um, just used direct relief as a really a mechanism to, to conduct their humanitarian work. So that allowed us to move fast and try to respond to um, the needs as we saw. And our orientation was initially just where we work with these community health centers and free and charitable clinics. And we were concerned about them. We have never in 72 years been asked to backstop U.S. hospitals, but they needed it too. So of course we you know, accommodated and brought, um, we have a big network in all 50 states of the nonprofit community health centers, but as the state of California and other states found us, we did everything we could to just allocate you know, materials so the really sick people who end up in the hospitals, those health workers could be protected as well. Thomas, how do you mobilize all this? That seems like a giant uh, undertaking. You know what? Somebody contacts you and they say, we need help and we need masks. And can you bring them here? How does the whole process work? Yeah, I think it, it's it, we're operationally intensive every day. So I think we I'm in a warehouse. I mean, it's a large warehouse. It's a nice warehouse, but it's a, a distribution center for medical commodities, um, including vaccines and cold chain drugs and cancer medications. And the, so the supplies that we have here, we have a method of making them available on an ongoing basis. So every day, you know, we're doing uh, receiving requests or orders and approving them and shipping them out. FedEx is one of the companies that for the last 15 years, their contribution to direct relief has been what they do. You know, I think um, they, they provide us free transportation services. Oh, wow. We plan around. So I think mm -hmm. their backbone is available as their charitable contribution, which is great for us because it averts the need to go raise money to go pay for transportation services. That's what they do, and um, they do it willingly, voluntarily, and they give us a, a budget, basically, that we can draw down on. So as these emergencies happen, um, we overspent what our allocation was, and they said, keep going. We've got this. If you, can, if you can do something, go. If you can get the materials, fill in order. So basically... Wow. Like I'm, I'm glad to know that, because I always like to know the companies who are really stepping up quietly. See, I didn't know that they were doing that. So that makes me want to put my dollars there. Honestly, go ahead. Yeah. Well, and you know, it's been uh, 11,000 deliveries or almost 12,000 now since January when this really mm. started to ramp up. So for us, it would be millions of dollars that we would otherwise have to raise and which has a cost associated with it. Wow. So contract with the trucking company. So the fact that we're dovetailed with FedEx on an ongoing basis and uh, really allows us to spend less cash and do more work you right one of the best logistics companies in the world with 400,000 employees and they're enormously generous they don't have to i mean it's my job to work here it's not their job to do it for free so we really are right. so thankful and it saves everyone money i mean it, our donors don't have to pay for that it, the service is very good but allowed us allowed us to scale um, basically what we do every day in emergencies, we do the same thing. You just have to do more of it faster. Um, and that's what we've been trying to do. So operational activity, it's like firefighters in California, law enforcement, every day, it's not a practice. Every call is actually a drill for um, something worse happening. So you see these wildfires that are historic, but you know, the firefighters just roll together extraordinarily well. And so operationally intensive organizations kind of deal with operations differently than non-operational organizations who are called. It's such, a, yeah. it's such a mammoth feat. I mean, I've been out on the front lines with firefighters covering them, frankly, mm -hmm. and it's always the backbone, which you guys do that, that nobody could do what they do if it wasn't for people like you. Now you've covered and you've worked with um, international um, situations. Um, you worked hurricanes. You've worked, um, as you said, wildfires. How did COVID nineteen, the explosion of COVID nineteen, um, affect you with boots on the ground, just going? Um, did it end up being 
um, where you had a surplus of things in your uh, warehouses? Or well, what? For us, it was fascinating. The first call um, that we received was from China. So ah. The director of the largest hospital in Wuhan, that were kind of ground zero for the outbreak. And he had heard about direct relief from um, someone up in the Bay Area whose wife was a physician. I mean, kind of a random connection. And right, he, interesting. And said, we really need PP, PPE. I mean, there's this kind of new virus. And he was basically running something akin to a UCLA tertiary care, a medical center that he was rapidly converting into an infectious disease treatment center. And they, you know, the anxiousness that was apparent on a Zoom call like this, he was in a full biohazard suit. And I thought, I don't think, of course, we understand the need, but I don't know that China has asked for help or would be willing to receive it. You know, it just is not something that they do. And, but we'll try. We wanted to help contain it as best we could. And we did have what we thought was a large uh, inventory of millions of these items that were needed. So as it turned out, they did need it. It was cleared. FedEx took an initial shipment within a day and on a free charter. And so that really gave us a sense of how serious that it was being taken by the physicians dealing with it in Wuhan. When was this, by the way? How far in, back does this go? This was January 23rd. So a couple of days after the first case was detected in in the United States. And we'd also responded to that immediately. I think up in mm -hmm. Seattle, it was, I think it was January 20th and our first shipment to the nonprofit centers around health centers around Seattle. That was our concern. Like, oh, gosh, you guys have to stay, you know, safe. Um, the China thing happened basically about the same time. And after a week of doing whatever we could, we told the officials in China at the hospitals, we don't think that we're in a good position to help. Your needs are far larger than our supplies and we're getting them from China. And so we, we do have obligations here. And so we're sorry, we just really feel it's important for us to kind of do whatever we can when it arrives as it had. So what we thought was a large stockpile got a lot smaller fast and we were trying to replenish, but understanding because we have these contacts in all 50 states, we could get a, a pretty early signal of where the you know, cases were, where the concerns were. And we were trying to fill them immediately just to keep the health workers on those nonprofit, uh, at least the nonprofit community centers intact because what we'd seen in previous disease outbreaks like Ebola is if you focus only on that particular disease and you throw everything at it, you neglect everything else. And that the, the disease burden rises and people ultimately you know, you had you have pre-existing needs that are still important. So you've got to do a little bit of both while focusing on the immediate, but not forgetting about the pre-existing, very important services that have to continue to be delivered. What was initially needed the most when you got the call from Wuhan? And finally, when you needed the help, um, when they needed help here uh, up in Washington state, and then it all exploded, right? There's New York, there's California and all the states in between. What was the main item? or two that was needed. Weren't they the ventilators? In which case, how did you even mobilize all that? That's a lot to do. Yeah, well, a lot of it was the, the basic protective PPE, yeah. masks, gowns, gloves, face shields, goggles, um, and you know, the, pretty much the standard items that were just in such high demand because you have to kind of burn through them a lot during the course of a day. Um, the ventilators was interesting, and that was a big topic of focus. I mean, that was uh, at the outset, the projections were we were so short on the availability of ventilators to deal with a potential surge in the hospitals, um, you know, they just weren't available. So we had, um, because of the wildfires, again, we had stocked some of these portable oxygen concentrators. They're battery powered, like instead of a tank that you carry around, it concentrates the O2 from the air. And one of the pulmonologists in China had asked for one. And we thought, why do you want these? And he said, I've got to get people out of the hospital when they're recovering, but they still need some oxygen supplementation, right? Ultimately, so, from what I understand, that may have been one of the most effective tools, right? For people struggling to breathe. Am I right? Yeah. And we ended up, you know, buying, we had 40 in case there was a wildfire mass evacuation. People on oxygen often, you know, struggle if they don't have their tank or their concentrator. So we bought 3,000 of them, thinking that this, if it happened there, it could well happen here. And this was the leading pulmonologist in China. So we thought, wow. okay. 
That's a good signal. As it turned out, ventilators we didn't have, we weren't going to get. They're kind of complicated, expensive machines. Mm. But the oxygen concentrators, as it's turned out, have become in very high demand, including mm. in hospitals here, as an alternative to the more intensive, um, invasive procedure, and they're, which is important, obviously, if people are needed. But it's an alternative that we have been making available um, throughout the country, mainly to hospitals so far. Now, you don't often reach out to those who are more well-known, but it certainly puts a face to you and what you do, right, over at Direct Relief. We all know that um, Sean Penn, right, um, with Core Response, they reached out to you and he was right there at the hospital line just sort of giving out supplies. How did you end up working with him? Well, I think... um, Sean Penn has been was has been very active in Haiti for the last decade, as has been Direct Relief, and so we were. And they provide human services, and a lot of they've done a tremendous work in uh, in Haiti. And I think Sean Penn is so passionate, and he just makes it happen somehow. So you know, when he got involved in Los Angeles and um, contacted us, he had an idea which he's since taken to a very large level of why are we having our firefighters and first responders doing something that can be done by trained volunteers, a relatively straightforward procedure. Let us take that off over and bring in people who can do the swabbing and putting the, um, the swab in the container. And I think he worked with Eric Garcetti in Los Angeles. And I think his passion mobilized a lot of volunteers but he needed PPE to do that. So we were happy to do that. He, was, um, he and his team were you know, very straightforward. We knew what they were doing and they've done a very good job. Uh, and I think met with the governor and have taken over a larger role just doing that. So that's that kind of, what does the si- situation need? Uh, clearly it was something that we didn't anticipate and there, it was no one's job to deal with COVID <laughs> at the scale. So I think for us trying to look at what's gonna be an important as a nonprofit that can typically move a little bit faster than, than governments, um, that seemed like a very good thing to do. And it's since pr- been proven that mobilizing volunteers with training, working in concert with the government officials who are trying to manage the big picture was a really good move. So that's how we got involved with um, CORE Response, which is uh, Sean's organization. Now, you're not um, held back by any federal, state, or local governments whatsoever, right? I mean, what you do, you raise money, and the money that you raise, that's how you're able to mobilize and do what you do, correct? Yeah, of course, we because we handle prescription drugs in all 50 states, I think we're the most mm-hmm. heavily regulated, audited nonprofit. I mean, you know, it's free right. money. But, so it's a deeply compliant environment we work in. So from the FDA to the uh, California FDA and all of the, so the controls are in place, but um, with respect to what we do, as long as it's consistent with our mission, serving a public benefit, we don't have a lot of conditional money, which I I, I worked in government. So I think you know, the constraint there is that money is allocated for a particular purpose and you really can't just take money from different accounts and do what might even make sense. So it's nice not to, uh, to have that flexibility with the private resources that nonprofits have, um, in our case at least, um, to be able to move fast and and just do what seems to be needed at the time without dealing too. You know, we check in. We don't want to be a surprise to any government. They do have, you know, obviously are have to manage these events, but we don't want them to see Direct Relief as in any way competing or anything else. It's just a complement that's private, privately funded, but it's for the public benefit as is government. Look, it's one common goal, hopefully, right? To help where needed, especially to boots on the ground. There's a crisis, you're there. Where else do you work globally? I mean, basically, you've, you're everywhere, right? Yeah, I think, you know, throughout, uh, with respect to COVID, I think it's been several dozen countries, uh, we've been kind of logging their requests. The, the virus is moving south to the Southern Hemisphere mm-hmm. as they're approaching winter. And so, you know, it's been very sober. They've seen um, in Ecuador and Paraguay and throughout Latin America, Mexico, where we have a small operation, they've looked at how much the U.S., the, the richest country in the history of the world, has struggled, you know, um, with a, an incredible health system. And they're looking at this same virus coming their way without the resources, not as mature a health system 
or the financial resources to put behind it. So they've been asking us for help and we've said, we, we're, we'll do everything we can, but we really are focused here now. I think the government, uh, the big wheels of government, they take a long time to start turning, but they go very far when they do start turning, right? So I think as the, the structures have come into place, we are turning our attention to say, how can we help you with less money and now very high prices to deal with things like these masks that we got made. Yeah. They were 58 cents to have manufactured. They were selling for $5, $8 a few weeks ago. And so that's something that just prices out most of the world. They Absolutely. Just, yeah. We're trying to figure out how we can mobilize again, the private resources to help people who really, really need, are going to need the help for obvious reasons that, that we know well now here. You know, you mentioned earlier um, in your comment that um, our health system, how we really struggle. Why do you think that is? Is it because this is my uh, observation, mm -hmm. you know, the federal government in 50 states and then there's counties and then there's cities. There's so many layers that we had to go through and every state had a, a different idea of how it wanted to either open or close. Um, and the federal government seemed to have been giving, you know, um, differing uh, messages. Um, what do you think? Uh, don't you think that that really added to our confusion here in the United States? Well, yeah, I mean, it, 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 you know, we're not political. I, I, I'll just make an observation. I don't intend it to be politically, you know, everything seems to get politically charged these days. But I think you're right. It was a, not a, uh, a unified approach. And, um, and that did cause confusion. You know, if you don't have a national guidance about what to do, I think it is the responsibility of the local, at every level of government, people need to be told, like, I'm scared, what's the plan? And I think in the absence of that kind of single message, um, for whatever reason, um, I think it was left to each state and each governor or each city. I mean, Los Angeles is a country size, it's larger than many countries, right? That's right. It, it, it is the responsibility, you can see the responsibility mayors, governors, they had to step up and provide the guidance that was needed. It was and the big scramble. I mean, you could really see that from state to state. Um, some were affected way, way harder than others. And I also not to get political because I don't want to do that to you. But it just seemed that uh, the guidance was was really um, lacking in some areas where people just had to make their own decisions and do the best they could. And you were there at least to back them up and get them what they needed. Um, that's not uncommon. I think the states have different, um, I mean, California is blessed in so many ways. And I think including right. great health system, a lot of terrific public uh, servants who work in at various levels of government, a lot of just expertise in the universities and just the general population. That's not equally true. I think you, if a, when hurricanes hit a, uh, poor areas in the Southeast, um, there's not a lot of money. Um, there's not a lot of investment. The infrastructure gets taken out. They just need help. So, we what are. happens in a case like that? Because you're right. I mean, let's look at Katrina. I, I'm sure that you were involved there. And let's look also at what happened in Puerto Rico and so many other places where the, the, the they're very, you know, impoverished areas. Um, I guess you do the best you can, right? And you just fill a need where you can. Yeah, we're still working in Puerto Rico. I think it, the same reason. I mean, that really got slammed and the power was out. And I think they had a lot, just a, a huge combination of problems from the hurricane. Um, Katrina's the same. We're working extensively with uh, the nonprofit community health centers down there now because, you know, as you've seen, a lot of the 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 effects are disproportionate in communities of color. Yeah. The, the proportionality of infection rates and fatalities it's disproportionately high for for people of ethnic and racial minorities, many of whom are in New, or New Orleans and the groups that we serve these community health centers. That's who they serve. And so for us, it's a natural plug-in point in disasters. So we try to just listen first and sort of work with the people we know because so many people rely on these locally run community health centers. They trust them. They, they're in their yeah. So we just want to infuse some private support for them. So first of all, they don't feel alone. And also that they have some meaningful support, uh, whether it's medications or supplies or even financial support. Um, so they can keep going because they're deeply committed people almost, you know, beautiful. Yeah. Um, how many folks work or volunteer with, uh, with you with direct relief? 
We have 103 people who are on staff here in, in uh, Santa Barbara, where we work. We have a handful of people that work in direct relief South Africa and direct relief Mexico. They're 501c3 equivalents that are based in those countries, trying to actually do what we do here. Wow. We can fight corporate sector, uh, just private um, enterprise to engage in some of these issues that affect all of us. I mean, just because yeah. you work in a business, I think sometimes nonprofits fall victim to the only value they see from a, a corporation is like, is a source of money. And we've looked at the, the private sector and said, well, they get money for a reason. They're good at their jobs. And so like FedEx, it, it would have been nice to, you know, ask them for money. But what we really wanted was the service right to the for the public benefit and there's such an opportunity to engage more people in these things that affect all of us if you invite them and don't make it political and don't patronize folks and i think that's um what we try to do in these other areas but we have 103 people who on staff a lot of people volunteer in different ways we have researchers who volunteer and contribute. Uh, we have a lot on our website. You can kind of our own versions of dashboards and a lot of the analysis that our research team has done. A lot of that comes from just collaborative efforts with academics and research institutions. Um, yeah, and some well-known folks, uh, you know, have caught your eye. Barbara Streisand, you said um, a few others, right? And that that helps with the fundraising. There's no doubt, right? Yeah, the notion that Barbara Streisand, you know, would find us and be so generous with her time and gracious comments. I mean, I, we don't roll that way. I mean, I work in a warehouse. It's a really nice warehouse, but I just don't, it, it's, it's really quite inspiring again. Because people, people can see when you're doing great things for other people um, and that touches them and they want to help. They want to, and, and in that case, you know, what could she do? She could help you raise money. She could help you raise awareness. You know, myself, I read about you. I thought, you know, and I've known about you for years and I thought, what could I do? I could put your story out there, right? You know, every little bit helps to get it out there. Um, Thank you. And yeah. I think, it's, Go ahead. I think the dilemma that we face, you know, if, you know, my sense is that what people want direct relief and other nonprofits to be is good at their jobs, mm. not good at fundraising. They want us to, you know, be good at our jobs and use their money in, a, in an efficient way. And I think the dilemma sometimes becomes you spend so much time worried about trying to compete in the marketplace of like intensive marketing and it's easy to waste a lot of money. So we just don't do it. We just try to be good at our jobs, uh, report it. We have a kind of a journalistic approach to our work. And that's- You do. You that's do. That's very true. Very, you just get the work done, you know, from the warehouse, you get it out there. Um, go ahead. I'm sorry. I interrupt you, but you're true. When you, and I heard that you said you operate like a journalist. I had to jump in. <laughs> we hired some journalists. You know, it's hard to pitch journalists. You know, they're very busy and it's a changing dynamic. So we hired a few people and we said, your job is just to report on the people and the places and the issues that we're working on. Do not worry about fundraising. People are, yeah. enough. We, we're not clever enough to manipulate people's emotions and figure that catchphrase or whatever. I, you know, we were not. And there are other people you can look at with admiration who do it for professionally, we, that's far out of our reach. But I think at some level, what everyone wants is us in any nonprofit, to just do what you say you're going to do and use our money wisely. I think in this case, what Direct Relief does is pretty easy to understand. People needed these materials and we were getting it right. fast and free. And that, I think, you know, was not that hard to understand. And that generated far stronger response than would have ever been reasonable for us to you know, Barbara's try. I mean, there's no way we would have, you know, we just screwed that up nine ways from Sunday if we actually tried to like have a celebrity outreach plan. I mean, you know, but others do it very well. Uh, we're not those. Type, that type. It says a lot about the work that you do. You want to give a shout out to any other companies that have really been instrumental in helping, helping you. You said 3M, you said uh, Federal Express, anyone else who's really stepped up to help? Yeah, I think a lot of the healthcare companies we work with on an ongoing basis, the Bayer company, like Bayer Aspirin Company, Bayer, yeah. um, <clears throat> Merck and Pfizer and Beckton Dickinson and uh, Pfizer again recently. And really, my only concern is who I'm not going to mention um, because there's been so many. The, the Unilever company through their Dove brand, um, a lot of the technology companies have really stepped up and and really this is all unsolicited support. So it wow. is 
words just, you know, I don't have the words to convey the depth of things and, and thousands of people and celebrities down in Los Angeles who they didn't have to do that. And we're not such a household name that they're getting much from it, but boy, it's, it's really fuel, not only for direct relief, but more importantly for people who are working on these front lines. And we tell them, Hey, this money is, yeah, we're sending it to you, but it came from all these people who saw direct relief as a way to help you. So yeah. know that there's a lot of people pulling for you. And that's a good thing to, for people who are struggling in, with a tough situation that that sense of someone cares that gets you up in the morning it keeps you going it gives you that sense of so that's what it's that's beautiful. Beautiful. I think that um really I wish I could say it was a brilliant plan that we had to captivate the attention of all these people it wasn't I mean it just happens and so we're happened. Really thankful for your you know just having me on and um and all the support that's come from all the different areas of society it's a pleasure. So now that we're flattening the curve, or appear to be, mm-hmm. here in California and in other areas of the country, and it's just emerging um, in other parts of the world, what will the greatest need be here, in your opinion, um, here in the States, here in California, moving forward with COVID-19? And are you able to project what might happen in the fall and winter? Is that what you're doing, too? We're, we're trying to. I think like everyone else, our research team has been deeply involved with kind of using the data uh, about mobility, how frequently and how far people move um, has been had a relatively close correlation to infection uh, rates. Right. And so that's one of the reasons they said just everyone stay put. So I think the concern has been um, a couple. One is, you know, the desire to flatten the curve meant the transmission rate. I think, unfortunately, it flattened all curves, economic curves and job curves. I mean, there's this massive effect on society to really flatten that one curve. And I think right now, trying to keep that curve flat and while safely letting the other curves go back in the right direction, that's that challenge that policymakers have. But from a health perspective, what we see is really a much more intensive, you know, I'm not sure how far it's going to go back, but just the, the sense of hygiene protection, distancing, as this virus is still so much is unknown about it, that we think is going to stay. More PPE will be needed just uniformly across the health system and even for individuals just to keep their uh, their faces covered. And really yeah. the severe, the front end of the wave is hitting the Southern Hemisphere now. And that that will right. be a real challenge. So I think with all the money that's been appropriated, the, you know, the focused attention, people are now able to make much more informed personal decisions, I think, here in the States. Um, There's certainly not an absence of information, although some of it's confusing. So my hope is that the natural good behavior of people will, um, and all the guidance that we've received, will will moderate accordingly and get back to as close to normal as we can with those adjustments. And then that's great. And then I think we're anticipating direct relief really being pulled in much more extensively in Africa and Latin America. We've already started, but uh, the, the sense of urgency that resembles where we were several months, a few months ago, it's palpable now when we get it's quite in, It's quite an education, really, to watch the wave and how it, you know, how it, where it began and how it came here and now where it's going, as you said, into the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah. And then hopefully, you know, we've got our scientists and doctors and everyone, I know everyone's working very hard on treatments, on vaccines, and we'll see where we go. But at least in the meantime, you're there to help support everyone, which is so fantastic. How can people donate? How can people learn more about you? Well, I think the best way is on our website. It's just directrelief.org. And mm-hmm. um, it's really, it, you know, my sense is that people should give their money as something they care about and they believe in. And so I would not be presumptuous and say, send money now. I think learn about what we're doing. and Learn, if, yeah. If you, are able to pitch in or interested, thank you. But it's not presumptuous, but we really think it's important. It's sort of like direct relief and we're private and completely privately funded. We don't have a religious or political affiliation, but our purpose is very much like governments. It's just for the public benefit. And that's why we have this tax status and we can, as a nonprofit. So I love if people just learn about us, whether they are in a position to help out or not, it's good for us to hear what they think and give any feedback or any ideas. That's how we learn. I love that. And I'd actually love to come and see your warehouse one day, if you don't mind. I mean, I couldn't imagine 
it's probably so enormous and extensive. That's if you don't mind, I, I may invite myself up there to do that. Open invitation whenever. Can yeah, I see. would like that so much. Thank I really appreciate you taking the time, Thomas, to talk to us. What you do is just so, so crucial and important and you do it so well. And um, the founding fathers would be very proud if they could see what you're doing now, right? Wow. Well, you know, it's a good reminder though. You know, I think back and if you think back to the, you know, 72 years ago, you know, we almost blew up the world. It was a world war. You know, I, I think, and so people who lived through that, it was hard to phase those people. And it's good to remember that we can do this. We can get PPE and the degree of difficulty of things that our species can do. We can mm. definitely protect our health workers. We can figure this out. We can. We have the best distribution capability ever conceived. We can do this, and I think it just, you know, depoliticize, get get it done, involve as many people of goodwill as possible. And I'm highly confident that our country is going to be fine. I'm concerned about how it may shake out in places that don't have all the richness of resources and talent and money that the United States does. So. But thank yeah, you. I appreciate that that uh, foresight and also your optimism. I think that's great. And I again, thank you so much for being here. And um, I really hope people enjoyed hearing about you, listening about you, and everyone who's um, who will be tuning into our podcast. I want to remind everyone we're out there on YouTube and Facebook and Instagram. We tweet about it, and then um, after you can hear our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, Pandora, anywhere that you get your podcast, people, you can find us. And also look up uh, Direct Relief. And again, a big thanks to Thomas Teague. I appreciate um, everything that you do and everyone there over at uh, Direct Relief. And um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in to Deborah Cobalt Live. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.